Early in 2023, TSMC presented some details about their new set of N3 or 3 nanometer nodes. One of the things that jumped out at me and other people is the static RAM or SRAM. TSMC has two N3 nodes, N3B and N3E. The former is a dead end reserved mostly for Apple's use. The latter, N3E, is the one most other customers like Nvidia and AMD will use. TSMC's presentation said that their N3E SRAM bit cell, or just cell, will be the same size as that of their N5 nodes. In other words, no SRAM scaling from the N4 to the N3 node generations. There's been a lot of concern and ink spilled over this revelation, but what is SRAM anyway, and how big of a deal is this? In this video, we take a look at one of the most important parts of the integrated circuit. This video is brought to you by the Asianometry Patreon. Early access members get to see new videos first, as well as select the references for those videos. Early access helps a lot, and I appreciate every pledge. Thanks, and on with the show. Before we talk about SRAM, we must talk about the memory hierarchy. There are a whole lot of memory technologies out there. The hierarchy sorts them by their response time. At one end, we have very fast memory, level 1, 2, or even 3 caches, which are often right on the chip. This is where SRAM often is on the hierarchy. It is very fast. It can pull out data within a few nanoseconds. But the drawback is that it is expensive to manufacture, and if that SRAM is embedded, meaning that it is placed on the chip, then it takes up precious space on the silicon. On the other side, we have things like dynamic RAM, and even further down, flash memory and hard drives. These memory systems are far cheaper and have much more data capacity. But they are off-chip, usually sitting on the motherboard, meaning that to access their data takes more time and will cost more energy. Modern systems like those on an IC require fast access to memory. As one of the memories closest to the system, SRAM is hugely important to an IC's overall cost and functionality. It's a big deal. The first SRAM design was patented in 1963 by Robert Norman of Fairchild Semiconductor. He designed it on his friend's breakfast room table in a few hours at IBM's request. IBM demanded that Fairchild sign over their patent, but the latter held firm. That first design used bipolar transistors. A year later, Fairchild patented another design using MOS transistors, a different structure that is far more scalable. In 1970, a 256-bit TTL SRAM produced by Fairchild was used for a computer main memory for the first time, a Burroughs ILLIAC 4. A year later, IBM shipped a System 370 Model 145 with a 128-bit version bipolar SRAM. SRAM has since been one of the most widely manufactured memories since, and a default choice for integrated circuits. Like its cousin, DRAM, SRAM is a volatile memory. This means that when you lose the power, they lose the data. Unlike its cousin, however, SRAM does not use a capacitor to store its bits of data. Thus, there is no need to periodically refresh the capacitor's charge to maintain data integrity. The most common cell design is the 6-transistor SRAM cell. It uses what is awkwardly called a bi-stable latch. Bi-stable because it has two stable states representing the ones and zeros of a bit of data. The latch is made up of a pair of inverters. An inverter is a single input and output device that toggles a signal to its opposite state. So, if a low signal, a zero in digital parlance, comes in, then the inverter device turns it into a high signal, a 1, and vice versa. We put two inverters together to create a feedback loop, the output of one inverter connecting to the input of its lovey-dovey partner. An inverter is made up of two transistors each, so that is four transistors in total. The other two transistors in the SRAM cell design, formerly called the passgate transistors, are for reading or writing the value of the data bit inside the latch. Pulling back, we have many memory cells strung up in a row. Each cell in the row is connected to a horizontal line that we call the word line, as well as two vertical lines that we call the bit lines. The word line is used to select a row of cells. Once selected, the cells can interact with their two bit lines. 
Modern high-performance system on chips, or SOCs, have demanded increasingly better embedded memories. In some cases, embedded SRAMs consume a major portion of the chip's area. Back in the mid-2000s, for some high-performance CPUs, SRAM percentage took up as much as 71% of the whole die. Today, there are some systems with 90% of their surface area covered in embedded memory. Note that high percentage isn't always the case. Portable devices, for instance, have less embedded memories, not only for spacing reasons, but also because SRAM cells use power and we want to minimize power draw on the limited battery. But I digress. My point here is that systems are always craving memory, but that memory doesn't always scale down as fast as everything else. Why is that? The SRAM cell is made up of transistors, but shrinking it is far more challenging than just making those transistors smaller. The first major challenge has to do with power leakage. Traditionally, SRAM cells use the most energy when they are switching, dynamic power, and that certainly was the case back when the transistors were larger. But as cells got more dense and the transistors shrank, focus shifted from reducing dynamic energy usage to leakage. Power leakage is when the charge flows through the gate in the transistor, but the gate is closed. This happens for several reasons, but the two most significant are sub-threshold leakage and gate tunneling. Okay, sub-threshold leakage. An open transistor gate closes when its voltage hits a threshold. That threshold is low, but not quite zero. So when the transistor hits the threshold voltage and closes, it can still conduct a very tiny current, even in its sub-threshold state. Kind of like a faucet that you close, but it keeps on dripping because you did not turn it tightly enough. As we scale down the gate size, the threshold voltage lowers to reduce overall power consumption. But as that threshold voltage lowers, the sub-threshold leakage rises like yeast in a warm room, as in drastically, about 10 times for every 0.1 volt decrease. The second is more intuitive. This is where the transistor gate has gotten to be so thin that the charge carriers like electrons and holes can quantum tunnel right through the 1 to 2 nanometer thick gate oxide layer. As the gate gets smaller, it gets thinner, which in turn makes the quantum tunneling effect more prevalent. These two effects were not really a problem going up to the 130 nanometer node, but suddenly took a big leap starting with the 90 nanometer node. This power leakage is a problem for anything not connected to a fusion reactor, but a particularly thorny issue for things depending on batteries. There are a few things that designers do to help eliminate some of the leaks. A notable one is the gated VDD technique, where we add more transistors to shore up the gate and prevent further leakage. Another major solution has been the introduction of new transistor gate designs like the FinFET. I've mentioned it before, but the FinFET is a type of 3D gate that covers the channel on three out of four sides, giving it more control over the current. FinFETs do indeed offer better power leakage and density. The old ITRS roadmap on semiconductors predicted that if nothing changed, then by 2014 some ICs would be 94% covered with just SRAM. FinFETs helped us avoid this dark future by introducing more miniaturization and efficiency. However, FinFETs are harder in general to produce. There's a greater risk of getting it wrong and ending up with defective products. That leads right into our next major challenge, process variation. There are two types of yield. Functional yield, which represents the fraction of ICs that work in the first place. And then there is parametric yield, which measures the variability in how the chip performs in speed and power. As a fab like TSMC or Samsung goes through its process steps producing the chip, very, very small variations from the recipe can eventually impair the product's final performance. These variations are extremely minute, but can generally be traced to difficulties in controlling lithography lines and the roughness of those lines. So the channel's width, length, or threshold voltages being just a bit off can lead to performance deterioration. And unfortunately, process defects do not scale down with size, making their impact on the product far greater. We measure this using something called static noise margin, or SNM. The SRAM cell is very busy, subject to a lot of electrical noise. Sometimes that noise can cause the cell to flip, losing its stored bit of data. SNM is a simple measure of how resistant the SRAM cell is to flipping, 
In other words, its resiliency and stability against noise. We can plot variations in length, width, and threshold voltage in each of the six transistors inside the cell against the resulting SNM to get what is called a butterfly curve, which look pretty cool. For the most part, the best way to avoid these is for the foundry to simply do better. Of course, easier said than done, but hey, that's why we pay $20,000 a wafer, right? Okay, so if the DRAM cell with one transistor has been so successful, then why keep the six transistor SRAM cell design? There are other designs with more or fewer transistors. The problem is that each design offers its own trade-offs, and density isn't always the ideal. That's the problem with memory, the dual mandate between capacity and performance. For instance, there exists a 5-transistor SRAM cell design, having just one access transistor and one bit line connected to it. It's more geared for density, taking up 15-20% to less space, but at the cost of less static noise margin. In other words, the cells are less stable. Way on the other side of the spectrum, we have the Chonk 10-transistor Schmidt Trigger SRAM cell design. It replaces the traditional inverters with what is called a Schmidt trigger, named after Otto Schmidt, who came up with them in 1934. It takes up twice as much area as the 5 transistor design, but gives you a far more stable SRAM cell. 10 transistors might be too much, but we might be seeing more Schmidt trigger based designs down the line. Its additional stability makes it very suitable for advanced nodes. There are also 8 and 9 transistor designs, but the 8 transistor design gives you great process stability but suffers from unacceptably bad power leakage. This hasn't been a good trade-off for manufacturers. The 9 transistor design gives improved power leakage and stability over the 6 transistor design, but at the cost of more area consumed and a fairly complicated design. Same as with the 8 transistor design, this is not a good trade-off. In the end, the 6 transistor design is most often used because it is simpler has acceptable power leakage, consumes less area, and has fewer noise issues. It strikes a balance in the criteria. I will be derelict in my duties if I do not mention anything related to advanced packaging at the end. The aforementioned challenges with SRAM cell scaling have caused companies to try stacked RAM arrangements. AMD and other chip companies are adopting stacked SRAM solutions where we put the SRAM die on top of the logic. For instance, AMD's 3D vCache, which involves a bunch of SRAM dies stacked on top of an existing level 3 cache. This allows us to add even more level 3 cache, and as like we all like to say, more memory is as good as I remember. Just kidding, nobody says that, I made it up just now. The more SRAM gets harder to scale down, the more people will be pushed towards advanced packaging solutions, and I think that's the right direction going forward. But can SRAM itself keep scaling? It looks like TSMC hit some limits on what can be done using the current FinFET architecture. Observers have posited that TSMC bit off more than it can chew with N3B, which is said to have had yield issues. I feel like reversing the SRAM density numbers like they did with N3E is a good indicator of that. But it is not and should not be the end of the line. Something about an IC being 90% plus SRAM just doesn't sit right with me. Logic dies should have logic circuits on them. I hope I'm not offending anyone when I say that. Figure out a way around the SRAM, and there's still so much more headroom to go. And as for the future of SRAM itself, next we have to move to gate all around FET gate, or nano sheet designs. This is where the gate wraps around the channel on all four sides for even more control. Samsung is already making these, Intel, TSMC, and SMIC are working towards it. A recent paper, though, hints that these structures might improve SRAM performance in other ways, but shrinkage itself might not continue. IMAX seems to suggest that fork sheets, another type of transistor gate with a different structure, would be better suited for continued scaling down. These are kind of like the gate all around, but adds an additional layer of dielectric cutting in between. Needless to say, these are going to be very, very hard to make. SRAM will always have a role in the IC. But it is looking to me quite clear that squeezing out more fast cache memory with SRAM is a steadily losing game. We will need alternative solutions. Alright everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, like this video, and I'll see you guys next time.